Again, good afternoon, everyone. As you uh, finish up your dessert and meal, it's a great pleasure to have you again here as part of the Jefferson College Friday Speaker Series. Well, our program today, the title is uh, behind me here on the screen, but it's Living Well in the Golden Years, Strategies and Resources, and it's being presented by Ms. Susie Welsh. Susie is a licensed clinical social worker. She's also a full-time faculty member in our Department of Sociology and Social Work here at the college. She earned her bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Missouri and her master's degree in social work from St. Louis University. Throughout her 25 years of working in the social work field, her focus and practice has primarily been on families in crisis. And her past work experiences have really encompassed all stages in a very diverse and resilient family life. Uh, some of the many areas that uh, she's had experience in include child welfare, adoption, individual and family counseling, crisis intervention, grief and loss, and medical social work. And beyond that, with her role as a social worker, she uh, cherishes her role as a family member too. And so she's eager to share today her resources, her insights, and ideas that help others thrive. And so with that today, Susie will be sharing with us specifically information, both personal and professional, in addressing a variety of topics related to aging in today's society. I think that's something we can all relate to today, right? Right? Uh, and so uh, they'll include uh, successfully navigating health, downsizing, uh, coping with illness, caregiving, relationships, technology, and also the sandwich generation. So please join me in giving a very warm Friday Speaker Series welcome to Miss Susie Welch. here okay if I talk too fast or anything which I give my mom credit for that uh, tell me to slow down a little bit I'm glad to do that um, so thank you for such a nice introduction and thanks for having me here today I'm really excited to talk with all of you today because aging is such a broad topic and essentially we're doing it from the moment we're born so we can use that as our frame of reference that um, we, we kind of look at it as a process throughout our lives. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. First, I wanted to talk a little bit about who I am uh, beyond what Roger said. I don't know if many of you have had a social worker or know about social workers, but social workers are in a lot of medical uh, facilities, especially as our generation is aging. It's more likely that some of you may have a social worker. When I worked in dialysis and transplant, I always told the uh, patients I was working with, you know, whether you want one or not, you have a social worker. It's a Medicare regulation in that particular area as well as some others. So it's part of what you may run into as part of your um, health care in the years to come. Um, and in addition to that, as Roger said, I'm a family member, but I'm a daughter and my mom is still living. My dad's deceased. I'm a daughter-in-law. My mother-in-law passed away. I, my father-in-law had passed before I was part of the family. I'm also a niece. Um, my aunt is getting older in years and she lives really close by. So that's an integral part of how I come upon some of this personal experience. And a concerned neighbor today because my sweet neighbor is going to have a hip replacement soon, so I'm worried about her too. So those are some of the things who we are as people in society. We care about people. We look out for people no matter what age we are. Um, you guys have done that throughout your lives, and hopefully we'll welcome if somebody needs to at some point give you a hand, um, etc. So that's kind of why we're talking about that today. In addition to the fact that I've noticed on campus especially, and relatively recently, conversations with coworkers about what's going on in their life often involves talk about children or family members and often involves talking about others who might need some resources or might need some extra care. And so that's another reason. It feels like a, a topic that we should be more open about and be able to share our knowledge. So what we're going to learn today, uh, Roger kind of ran through. It's very diverse. It's pretty broad. And I think every time Lisa saw me, she was telling me the numbers were higher. So I was getting more nervous and trying to remain broad in my topics. With that said, I am a social worker, so not to you know offend or make anyone blush, but there really are no topics that we won't talk about with people. So if you guys 
decide you want to ask a question or go to a certain area of conversation in the questions and answers that we didn't include on here, that's just fine with me too. I was just trying to keep it as broad as possible to connect with everybody. So one of my favorite quotes came from someone who's not famous. Uh, he is uh, someone who has a Master's of Divinity, and it just speaks to who we are as people in society, so I'll read that to you. We don't heal or change others. We represent ourselves as human beings that are convinced that there is a way, and we are committing to, committed to helping others find their way. That is what we do as helpers. Helpers represent ordinariness and humanity. I may have a degree as a social worker, but I've been a helper from the time I was a little kid. If I were an accountant, I think my personality would have meant I'm just as concerned about my neighbor or my mom um, as a social worker, as an accountant. We do have skills and knowledge that balance that and help us connect in other ways and hopefully give you guys some resources. So, so question for you guys to kind of throw back. Think about how are you living well in the golden years? So here's a couple of examples. At 88, Betty White was the oldest person to ever host Saturday Night Live. <laughs> ben Franklin at 81 assisted in the compromise that led to the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. 81. <laughs> Grandma Moses didn't start painting till she was 78 and she created over 1,500 works of art before she died at age 101. And George Burns won an Academy Award at 80 for his performance in The Sunshine Boys. So now it's your turn, right? Like, what do you want to do? Set the bar. Think about things you want to accomplish that maybe you haven't started yet. And one of the things that is always coming through in my support, in my counseling for anybody, if you have a vision for something or you've always done something and it seems out of reach, modify it. Don't stop doing it. Don't stop doing what you love. So we're going to look at some statistics. I wouldn't be much of a sociology and social work instructor if I didn't add a few statistics in, right? Um, AARP forecasts that between 2006 and 2030, the population of 65 plus individuals in the United States will nearly double. You guys may have heard that before. And then our breaking news from U.S. Census Bureau, if I can do this the way I'm supposed to, is that middle age in the U.S. already outnumber children, but we're going to have a new demographic. It will be an older population than ever before. So by 2035, we will have more adults than children in the United States. Is that new information for anybody? Okay. Okay. So that gives you a sense of sort of where we're at as a society and the importance of recognizing needs for changes in programs and, and speaking up for what you need as well. Whoops, sorry. So, is anybody familiar with this? It's a population pyramid. <laughs> um, this is 1960, and this is the forecast for 2060. Anybody who's looked at these a little bit can kind of recognize. At the very top, we have folks who are 85 plus. Left is male, right is female. Look how large that number has become by 2060. That's the forecast. One of my coworkers uh, speculated that I wonder if at some point we'll have like an inverted pyramid almost instead of a column, which is what they're talking about now. So pyramid to pillar. So that's from the U.S. Census Bureau. What about Missouri? It's important to know what's happening where we're living too. Missouri's senior population is defined as those 65 and older also, is expected to increase dramatically in the next several years. So in 2000, it was less than 15% of our state's population as those over 65, and it will increase to 20% by 2030. So we can expect that about one in five of our neighbors, <coughs> friends, family members will be senior citizens by our definition that we use now. And that comes from Missouri Senior Report. Sidebar, in case I forget to say it, we have a great LibGuide that you can access through our library website, and it's open to everybody. You might scroll down and see that it says social work, but we have lots of links and information. Um, I'll give you guys some pages with links as well, so you can check information out if you're just curious, or you like statistics. <laughs> so, what's successful aging? So, as early as 44 BC, Cicero wrote an essay about the nature of good aging. In it, he claimed that in order to age well, one needs to take care of one's health, be moderate in one's food and drink consumption, maintain one's capability to think, and remain independent of another person's guardianship. Fast forward to 1944, that research 
we call it gerontology, that's concerned with successful aging, just started to become popular. So Cicero was way ahead of his time, but it's a conversation we've been having for a long time. The demographics change a lot, though, which we've been looking at. Um, another study in 2009 also looked at successful aging factors. So basically, in all the examples, whether old or new, we can look at health and management of physical concerns, successful or effective coping, and a positive view of aging as all keys to success as we are aging in society. So the first thing we're going to talk about is embracing your health. Say yes. Say yes to making changes if that's something that you need to be doing. Say yes to continuing or modifying. I know for myself, as we hit all those rainy days, I thought all I want to do is get outside and walk because I love walking outside. And so I had to go with the treadmill, which I think is pretty dull comparatively to talking to neighbors and things like that. Sometimes we have to modify. So some of the factors related to health. Not smoking or quitting if you've already been a smoker. Developing a positive view of life and life's crises. Life is a roller coaster. No matter your age, it's a lot of ups and downs, and nobody's exempt from that. I always say everybody has a something. You can't always look at somebody and see what their something is, but we all have a something. Avoiding alcohol and substance abuse, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising regularly, continuing to get education. This is something you guys are preaching to the choir, right? You're right here learning new things, continuing education. Um, having a happy marriage or happiness in relationships, right? We're going to talk a little bit about relationships and spouses, but just having happy relationships, fostering those, bless you, and nurturing those overall is an important thing. So if exercise is one way to offset the natural pro process of aging, what other things can we do to keep fit mentally and physically? I don't know if you guys are usually interactive, but <laughs> I, I teach, so what do you guys do to keep fit mentally or, yes? Work out at the cardiovascular clinic. Okay, good. Work, at the work out at the cardiovascular clinic. Good, yes? Water fitness class. Water fitness, great. Low impact, right? Is this the water? Oh, here? <laughs> okay, we're not going to get into any uh, <laughs> the political debates or anything. Yes? Being a volunteer, staying active, having a reason to set your alarm and get up and moving every day, right? Yes? Maintaining certain passions in life, of uh, things of interest in things, and Good. continue them. Maintaining passions that you have I in like life and continue it. Modify. If you have to, modify, right? There's always a way. Yes? I like the excerpt that comes out, I think it's four, four months from the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Mm -hmm. It's called Brain Busters. They're really brain busters. Yes, that's good. My mother-in-law did crossword puzzles. I mean, around the clock. She had more crossword puzzles than anybody I knew, but she always solved them. She never set one aside that she didn't finish, right? So we can kind of prompt ourselves to push beyond what we think we can do to keep mentally and physically fit and hold ourselves, right? Hold ourselves to a standard and each other as well. Relationships are really important, um, whether you're aging or just a little bitty or a newborn, right? We know that that's an important part of our socialization and who we are in society. Cultural views about aging vary significantly. As in the U.S., we see it as a sign of successful aging, as we mentioned, to be living independently. Chinese culture, the elders wondered, who would want to do that? <laughs> who wants to live alone, right? So it's a very different perspective, independence versus aloneness. And so we kind of balance that. Um, so I want you to kind of think as we're talking about this, who's in your primary group? That tightest circle, closest around you. If you had to, if you have a flat tire, who do you call? Um, if you run out of gas, I say that one to college students. You guys probably don't do it. But if you ran out of gas, who would you call and say, hey, I ran out of gas, right? Um, who's in your primary group that you would say the good, the bad, and everything in between? Uh, a lot of times that's children, possibly grandchildren as well, and spouses or partners or significant others. And one thing that's interesting as folks get older and kids are out of the house, um, they, the friends take a front seat again in terms of connections, and that becomes a really important part of our socialization. Checking on each other, going out to lunch, going shopping, going to the dollar store, or whatever, Olive Garden, wherever you're going with your friends, um, if it's Friday lunch date or Saturday breakfast, McDonald's morning coffee, that's a big one, right? With, you know, got your senior coffee and there are other people there. 
There's a reason to get up and set your alarm, even if you don't have a really tight schedule like a job would offer you. We get lots of feelings of productivity, uh, more than just a paycheck when we go to work. We get feelings of productivity, we get connectedness to others, we get those relationships that are maybe secondary relationships can become primary relationships because you've developed those connections. Just because you retire doesn't mean that you don't need those anymore. We just have to be creative and find them in other ways. Volunteering, I think you had said over here, fantastic way to go, right? Being involved and being connected. So those relationships are really key. We have to talk about the sandwich generation. So that's our picture of a sandwich here. <laughs> Has anybody heard of the sandwich generation before? Okay, so the sandwich generation is a generation of adults, likely your children, possibly grandchildren, who are sandwiched. They're simultaneously supporting aging parents at the same time they are raising a family. It's unique right now in our culture. Doesn't mean it didn't happen before. Some of you may have experienced that, but it's unique that we have such a large number who are in this position, and it's a result of a couple of things. People are living longer. Our life expectancy is longer. Our technology improves. People with chronic illness, somebody said penicillin, right? There's a lot of reasons that people are living longer lives. But as well, the next generation is delaying childbearing. So older starting to have children and family members living longer means that both of those things are being balanced at the same time. This is likely to increase and continue because of longevity, <coughs> chronic diseases that are well managed, um, sometimes there's not as much support for a caregiver, so there may be other connections. There may be fewer siblings to help. Bigger families meant more people could ship together and help each other out. If our average family size is two children or fewer, that's more people in that um, caregiver role or support role that have to be connected, so there's more going on there. And there is, of course, in the United States a commitment to parental care. That's a value that we hold in our society. All right, a little more about relationships, grandparenting. Um, grandparents report enormous benefits from having close relationships, I'm sorry, grandchildren, grandparents as well, report enormous benefits from relationships with grandparents. They develop a sense of family ideals. Moral beliefs are sometimes coming strongly from grandparents and a strong work ethic. Some of you, as we've seen many in society, may have helped to raise grandkids or been the primary daycare provider for grandkids. We are predominantly a dual income uh, nation where both partners in a relationship are working just to maintain household and status quo. And in order to do that, and with rising daycare costs, sometimes family caregivers are, are the, the go-to. So we're all grateful for that as well. Uh, but the influence then, we had, uh, there were choral performances and band performances in the theater this week. And that's where my office is, is in the Fine Arts Building, not in the theater. And I can't tell you how many grandparents and grandchildren were coming, little grandchildren, to come and see older siblings. So it was kind of neat to see that this week. But that connectedness, that activity is really key. We can talk about relationships with a spouse or significant other. At a time when divorce is becoming less common for younger adults, we have this thing called the gray divorce kind of concept. And that is that folks who are 50 and older are at a higher rate of divorce in our nation right now. It's nearly doubled since the 1990s. Interesting, isn't it? People are puzzled by that. Um, in class, I kind of joke that, uh, I heard this somewhere, I didn't make it up, but somebody said, um, why do you think it's going like that? And the person said, well, I think forever's gotten longer. And people said, that's enough. <laughs> forever got a little longer because the life expectancy. <laughs> With long-term marriages, we do know that those show increased uh, feelings of well-being. Um, there's lots of health improvement that comes with uh, long-term marriages and long-term relationships as well. So that was just a little joke. Um, caregiving can be a part of any relationship in adult life. And sometimes caregivers might be flipped and not the sandwich generation, but it could be that someone is helping care for a spouse and trying to balance caring for grandchildren at the same time. That's a challenging place to begin. And it's, it's familiar to a lot of folks in our society. So again, while I don't want to go too long on caregiving and illness and things like that, um, I'm glad to talk about resources. I did have, 
I've made a lot of links here for you guys, um, so I'll pass these out too. There are lots of supports and resources available for caregivers. Caring, caring for another person, whether it's a child, a parent, or a spouse, can be absolutely some of the most challenging, but some of the most rewarding and life-giving things that you can do for anybody in your life or in theirs. Um, there are so many benefits. As social workers, we see families as very resilient. Um, we like to see families bounce back from difficult situations and come out stronger and better when the times get tough. You guys can probably reflect on times in your life where you saw that happen. And it does boost you. It gives you life, really, to see this happening. Um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't challenging. We know the challenges that can come with that. There are lots of organizations in and around uh, St. Louis area, Jefferson <coughs> County area, and I'm glad I put some cards back there. If anybody just needs resource numbers or something, I'm glad to help you find places for those. Mideast Area Agency on Aging, Meals on Wheels, and Lots of Helping Hands, or Karen Bridge, if you guys have heard of those before. Um, Mideast Area Agency on Aging does a broad, they, they do so much I can't even tell you, but information and referral, sorry, um, that was me. And uh, they have Meals on Wheels, or a meal senior meal program at, near the, in the Arnold Rec Center. Um, they have lots and lots of things going on. Meals on Wheels can be something that you can have a hot meal delivered to your house. You don't have to have a doctor's order or anything for it. You just have to have a need and a desire for it. The benefit of that is it's a check-in as well as a hot meal. If somebody can't do everything for themselves or they're waiting for a family member to come home from work or something, um, there's somebody checking on them at lunchtime with, you know, <coughs> chicken and rice or um, something like that to kind of be available and connect with them. So Meals on Wheels is a great program. The flip side of that, Meals on Wheels always needs volunteers. And again, what a wonderful way to connect with other people by going out into the community. So back before everybody was more tech savvy um, and technology wasn't as available, what did we do when there was something going on or a close family member was in crisis? What did we do to update everybody? Lots of phone calls, phone chains sometimes, right? Um, you might have had a flyer at your faith community, a bulletin or something that said who was in the hospital or who needed help. Um, but it was kind of a slower process. We now have websites. Lots of Helping Hands is one of them. Caring Bridge is another. And you can literally go on these websites, create an account, and it will give a calendar. So whether this is for your granddaughter who's a new mom or for yourself because you're going to have surgery and need a little bit of help with dinners for a while, you can go on and write down what the need is and what days it's needed. Then you go and send this, this email. It's all very user-friendly. You send out an email to people who have said, can I help? What can I do to help? It's a gift to other people to say yes to that. You know the help that you've done in your life and how it makes you feel like you can do something. And so asking for that in return is a great thing. So these email goes out, people sign up on the calendar, and everything just starts happening. It's a really smooth way to go. I've known people who have also put family members in charge of that. They say, well, I've got too much going on. I'll tell you what I need. You go ahead and do the website, and you can send updates as well. So both of those are available. One thing I neglected to include is um, any kind of medic alert button. I thought I had that link on there, too. If you, if you are wanting to remain independent, the best thing to do is plan ahead and make that happen, right? Um, remaining independent means you have a way, if something happens, to get in touch with somebody instead of just having to call 911 or something like that. So um, those medic alert buttons or bracelets are a great resource as well. Mental health, substance abuse, and just support for those. Again, we're not going to stay on that topic too, too long, but seniors are just by the nature of things that are going on in your life or maybe, maybe at higher risk for anxiety, depression, or substance abuse because of unexpected changes in lifestyle or circumstance or the situation for somebody that they care about. And in the past, there's been a real stigma about counseling. I won't generalize about what generations that was or wasn't part of, but changes in mental health status or family issues, it's very manageable. From my perspective, sometimes people just come in, you know, over the years have come in for like brief therapy, get some tools, get some ways to manage, have a family meeting, and things are so much better than they were trying to figure it all out yourself. 
So I would encourage people to think about that. If you have something that's kind of um, been troubling you, get some help with that. It's amazing how much better you can feel. So sometimes support is needed. Don't be afraid to reach out for that. So that can be through the faith community that you belong to if you do, um, community counseling services. Insurance usually has something in the book that says uh, behavioral health, or maybe it says social worker, psychologist, or psychiatrist. When you go to that, it can be covered by your insurance too. So look in your insurance provider book if you have that. Um, if you know somebody who goes to a private therapist and they came well recommended, that would be another way to connect. And there are also groups and things specific to something you might be dealing with. Loss of a spouse, um, situations in the family, a particular medical condition. So groups can be helpful with that also. How many of you heard the word aging in place or the phrase? Anybody? Couple? I thought it would be the whole room. All right, aging in place is getting to be a very popular term, and the U.S. Center for Disease Control defines it as the ability to live in one's home and community safely, independently, and comfortably, regardless of age, income, or ability level. Does that sound like a tall order? It may to some degree, but there is help available. There are lots of resources, especially on AARP website. Um, there's some aging websites as well that talk about how you can connect and start that process. It's a great idea to plan ahead and think when you're really well and really active what your surroundings look like and what you'd want to be different if there's a time, let's say you had to have a minor surgery or something, and everybody's a little more fragile after surgery as we know. So what would you need to change about the place that you live? If there's somebody in your family who is going to need some kind of assistance, a wheelchair, walker, or something, maybe your doors need to be wider. Did you know you can plan ahead for that? That there are people just waiting to help modify your house so you can stay where you're at? If that fails, you can consider a move to a villa or community apartments, retirement apartments. There are communities being planned specifically for seniors so that everything is accessible, right? Has anybody heard of that before? Okay. And they're glad for you to come and see them, preview, look around a little bit. Downsizing is an important part of that, because a lot of people are in their house and they think, I would think about moving, but <laughs> the attic, the basement, I have some stuff, maybe a little more than I wanted. It's a great idea to do that a little bit at a time. So this is a great opportunity, again, while you're doing really well and feeling well and maybe got some time over summer with a family member, start to review what do you need, what do you want, and what might others be able to use that you'd rather give it to them now than worry about falling over or packing it in a box to move if you're going to move? What you'd like to share with family members and people that are significant to you. It's, it's a, back when I was younger with my grandparents, I was pretty young when my grandparents died, uh, people say, oh, that's morbid to talk about. Why would you want to talk about giving things away? But what I found with my mom, because she did downsize, she knows that I'm talking about her, um, she did downsize is that it was actually a really interesting thing from a family perspective, from a historical perspective, family tree. There were things that had been stored that I had never seen, never needed to see. And so mom was kind of going through the process of determining, like, is this necessary? Who could benefit? Which of the kids is working on family tree stuff, right? So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So let's, we'll try to all think about downsizing in a positive way. Again, I will say, people recognize that this population is growing, and there are folks who are in the business of helping to downsize. So if you're somebody that wants to have somebody help with it and not ask family members, you can always do that as well. How many people have known anybody, doesn't have to be anybody, who's with you? Anybody that you've been a little worried about, your dri about their driving? Maybe you were just behind them on 55 and thinking, oh, right? So we have that issue. And of everything that I thought, I could, I could go through 10 trees today with all the things that I need to print up or could print up. That's why I switched to links. But the things that I did print, not a copy for everybody, were the things that are a little harder to find about driving and aging and that kind of information. So most of you may know that seniors who are age 70 and older in the state of Missouri are usually required to renew their license in person. 
once she turned 70. And then at that point, instead of the license being good for six years, like it has been all, you know, throughout your life since you're 16, it's renewed just three years at a time. Sometimes the gap in between might be maybe the person behind you who's in front of you on 55 was in that gap in between and you were still concerned, right? So there's an, uh, there's an unsafe driving, I'm kind of skipping ahead a minute, but there's an unsafe driving form and I did make some copies of that. People, when I worked in medical, a lot of times children or neighbors or somebody would say, I'm not sure about them driving anymore. I'm a little worried about that. Driving is our independence, probably from the time we're 16, right? We see that as our tool to get somewhere else. We don't want somebody to lose that unless there is a significant reason to. So reporting on safe driving is sometimes just a way to get additional help for that person. Um, there's a form for it. People always say, do you have to say who you are? That comes up a lot. Um, reporters have to identify themselves, but the unsafe, sorry, I have to stop that. Um, they have to, uh, they don't have to be identified to the person unless there's a court order. So you can report to the office, they're not gonna tell the person, but if they're court ordered to, then they have to. Does that make sense? Okay. There is a driver's assessment. Has anybody heard of that? You can go to St. John's, or Mercy, sorry, I'll call it the right thing. Mercy Therapy, it's not covered by insurance, it's a little over $200. I did bring forms for that too. That's a well-kept secret, but a lot of people know it. Um, you can go and they will drive with your person that you're concerned about for a while. Um, this person will evaluate, I believe it's through occupational therapy, they'll evaluate everything from vision to reflex time to everything else. And in addition to that, instead of just making a hard and fast rule, you won't drive, you will drive, they give additional training and practice and they have ways to help rehabilitate somebody if they've had some trouble. So again, these are well-kept secrets that you know some people know, some people don't. So those are the ones I made copy for. The last thing I'll say about transportation is that some of you may have insurance that actually helps pay for transportation to non-emergency medical appointments. Medicaid in Missouri does that and some other insurances or supplements do as well. So if you had a thought to look at that, that might be something to consider. If you have an appointment to go to, maybe you can drive fine for everything, but you're a little nervous driving to or from a particular treatment or procedure. Okay? Yes. What are your thoughts about, I'm thinking of my parents, about the use of Uber or Lyft or something like that? I'm measuring my words. <laughs> so, as a social worker, I joke that you get paid to worry, and I'm a worrier. So, with that set aside, I think that there are times when if it's a hospital or a medical facility that they're going to, they may know a particular driver that they can recommend, or maybe you have a good experience with one and continue to use that person. Mm -hmm. I would be a little cautious about just calling, you know, whomever. It's kind of nice to get into a routine with somebody that you trust. Again, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the mental status of the person who's going. You don't want them to be in a position, and I don't know about your parents, but uh, you don't want them to be in a position where somebody might be, um, you know, worry about identity theft or theft in general, um, some kind of abuse or of their position. So that's my only caution. But I tell my other, you know, I tell my own kids like, who, who's the designated driver? Oh, we're thinking about Uber. I'm like, no, who is the designated driver? It just makes me a little nervous. I'm a little old school, so. Okay. Does that help that a little? Is, my cautious, politically correct answer. Not really what I wanted to hear. I'm sorry, okay. Sandy. I'm sorry. Okay. So technology, I won't, I won't ask too specifically, but some of you might look at this and think, hmm. So our numbers of seniors who are using the internet, which is why I felt comfortable using these links, 67% of seniors are using the internet. Um, it's a 55 percentage point increase in just under two decades. This might be a little harder to see, but tech use, this is from Pew Research, tech use is up, especially um, up to age about 75. Once somebody reaches 75, it's a little less high and then definitely over 80 fewer people are using it down around 44 percent but look at that 65 to 69 percent i'm sorry 65 to 69 years old 82 percent are using the internet and of 65 to 69 year olds uh 59 percent own a smartphone right so smartphone 
a phone that will text or you can send pictures and things like that. So we have this kind of this expectation of connectedness. Um, sometimes if you don't have it yourself, you still know how to use it and you might ask somebody to send a picture or a text to another family member because you know that they can do it and you know that it's possible. But the beautiful thing about technology is it's a way to stay connected. And the caution that I think you'll see, we want people to stay connected. It has helped reduce feelings of isolation, depression. You can see more frequent pictures of grandchildren that might live farther away. Family members can keep up and you know a little more about the day to day. So what we would caution is, don't use it as a substitute for interaction. Connect with your friends, plan a time to get together and then go see each other in person, right? Um, it's a good thing when the weather's bad or icy, you can kind of pave the way to connect again after, um, after the weather's better, et cetera. So you don't want to use it as a substitute exclusively and create isolation for yourself, but it's a great tool. There was another thing I read that said, um, for all the Facebook numbers that younger generations have, like the 18 to 24, they might have 600 or 1,000 friends on Facebook. They said anybody who is 50 or 55 and older is more likely to have a smaller list of friends, but they're really your friends. You would really get together with them and their friends or family. So kudos to right, the over 55 crowd for getting that right. All right, wealth, poverty, and aging. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but there's a big uh, idea about what retirement should look like. We see more commercials of people doing this or that or what it looks like on a medicine commercial or a travel commercial. There's really, we have to be careful about that stigma um, and not buy into that. Retirement is what it is for you, and you navigate that the best way that you can. Flexibility is important. It's different for every individual. It's different for every family. While you might have a plan to be doing things one way, you may find that family members in crisis need help financially or need help in terms of a place to stay or support. So things might change a little for you. So flexibility is key. Changes could be coming. We hear a lot about Social Security, um, so that's something to stay in touch with. The reality is that older adults' wealth varies widely. And one significant fact, older people tend to have more wealth but less income than younger people. More wealth, less income. All right. So this was my attempt since uh, I couldn't use copyrighted Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. <coughs> Medicare, <laughs> Medicaid, insurance. Oh, my. <laughs> so that is a really big topic. It's bigger than we could manage because it's so individual. But it's really important to connect with folks who can help you with that. I know one of your previous speaker series uh, folks was talking about Medicaid. If there is somebody that you connect with in a healthcare setting, um, in a counseling setting, you can ask for social workers, you can ask for care managers, you can ask for insurance specialists to help you walk through finding the best care for you or somebody that you love and uh, doing that in a way that attends to your finances. All right, we're on the last couple, home stretch. Leisure activities, don't say no, say how. That's the modify, right? Um, we got a great quote, as soon as you feel too old to do a thing, do it. <laughs> couple of did you knows, Missouri Department of Conservation has accessible lakes and nature preserves. Missouri is great for that. Powder Valley is a great place to go and that's not too far away. Did you know that people who are on dialysis can take dialysis cruises? Has anybody heard of that before? So maybe you have a friend who thinks, I can't travel anymore, I'm out of the loop. Sign up for a dialysis cruise. You go along with them. When they're out at sea, they're getting their treatment. When they're in port, they get to do everything fun with everybody else. So there's a link. I think it's on here. It is. Yep. Uh, and travel insurance. It's just a good idea. If you're going to make a trip and make some plans, Get some travel insurance so that if something happens or upsets the apple cart that you're still going to be okay and you can take it another time. All right, so what's coming up next? Seniors are going to increase in number and political clout in the United States. Greater attention will be, I would say is, being paid to the needs of the elderly as consumers, community planners, voters. Use your voice. Say what you need in your own community. Be part of all of it, get involved, and advocate. Advocate for yourself and others who are in similar situations to you. So in conclusion, we've seen since early times that success in aging is a strength, that it's something we can do with positivity, <coughs> openness to support, resources, et cetera. And again, as soon as you feel too old to do something, do it. Keep it up.
All right. So I think if I didn't go too far over, do we have time for questions if you want? Okay. okay. So anybody have anything pressing? Uh, with that, I'll also say if there's a resource or uh, I think some of the things that people ask about, discussion about end of life decisions, um, discussion about sexuality, those are some of the things that people want to know more about and don't necessarily want to ask in a group. There are resources to connect with that as well and I'm glad to pass those on. I was going to introduce at the beginning and say, welcome to the part of a, first part of a 12 part series because it feels like there's so much. I've got a stack of papers over there. We just have a lot of things to talk about. All right. Yes. I wonder what is meant when you're talking about driving and a slow reaction time. Is that like from the time you realize you need to stop until you hit that brake? Or is it the time it takes you to see something and realize, oops, I need to stop? I would argue that it could mean either, and that if there's a concern for either one, it might be worth talking to somebody about or getting evaluation. Because either of those could put you in a potential situation to have an accident. It could delay what needs to happen. Yeah, you know, which was like, oh, I can hit that brake like that. But <laughs> you know, I notice when I see stuff, it's taking me a little extra time to know what the same hell it is I'm mm. looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that would be, I think either of those might be a reason to, you know, I'm not a doctor, I would just talk to your doctor about it. That's always a great, your um, medical care is a great place to get started. Sometimes it's not only the physician, it could be the nurse practitioner, or the nurse that you see and you talk to in detail every time when you go in, you might have longer with that person than with your doctor, and you might give them the heads up, I was wondering about something, and they can pass that on to you. Yes. Remember when you take Granny's car away from her? You're going to have to drive Granny. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't recommending, but I do think there are, you know, just the safety issue. Probably out of the whole room, there's probably only a handful of people that might really be worried for themselves or somebody close. But it's nice to have a tool to be able to connect and double check that. Because I think, I think for so many years it's been either or. Um, either we let this person drive or we don't. And I just highlighted those because there are in-betweens, right? That you can check and it's objective because it's a third party and it's not personal. Um, and that person can give guidance and wise advice. And I never mind driving people because I think, well, they're safer for doing it and that's okay with me too. Better for all of us. Yes. I know there are a lot of advantages to hospice care, but could you address if there's any downside to it, something we need to be cautious about or aware of? Are you thinking of hospice in home or in a hospice center or hospital? Mostly I'm thinking in home, but either way. Really. Okay, so hospice is a super individual decision like by family. Um, I usually, and I did, meet with full family for those conversations. So again, without, I don't want to upset anybody, but you know, just talking about things specifically. Um, let's say there are males and females that are going to be caregiving and helping children, in-laws, etc., and maybe there are predominantly males. If the person has gotten to a point where they're not getting up to use the restroom, are they comfortable with helping with bathing and things like that? If they're not, it's, it's not going to be a successful plan. Do they have a bedroom and a bathroom on the main level of the house? If they don't and everything's upstairs or some of that is upstairs, that's not going to be an option. So what I will say is that when you get to the point of, of talking about hospice, that is an area where um, nursing staff and especially social workers, chaplains, they work as a team and help do family meetings to evaluate is this going to be the best thing, um, what will be some of the challenges and some of the concerns because it is so individual. There's not a right or wrong. There isn't a right or wrong. It's just what's right or wrong for that family, what's going to work best for them. Um, and also tuning into if that person who is on hospice is still alert and oriented. Uh, have they said anything about whether they want it or not, whether they want to be at home or not? Because it's, it's a good thing when families feel like they can honor that person's wishes to the best of their ability. And then there's also an option to call in for help as well. Hospice always comes with nursing, chaplain, social worker coming in home as well. 
but the bulk of the time is with family members who have said that they'll care for that person. Is that up? 